where what does it mean to measure the wholesomeness of a Muslim? So I'll give you like practical examples. You might someone find someone that has great attitudes about their religion. You ask them about Islam and they light up and they say, I love my religion. They don't look the part. They don't pray the part. They're not in the masjid, but you meet this person in public and you ask them about Islam and they light up. They have a great attitude about their religion. They'll defend it against any Islamophobe, right? Attitude is great. Maybe they're lacking in other areas. You have some people that have great spiritual practice, but their spiritual practice is not translating to any level of contribution back to the society, back to community. That's a deficiency. The spirituality part is great, but how do you launch then into the contribution? There are some people that have strong belief in Islam, like their creed is solid, philosophy. They could argue with people, they could do da'wah to people in the park, they could take on people and all types of things but they're not really practicing Muslims. It's really relegated to the intellectual space because we have a tendency to imbalance. And our lives are an opportunity to try to balance ourselves out to be the most wholesome servants of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala before we meet Him. You might have someone that is B-A-S-C heavy, but they don't have a connection to the masjid. And I understand institutions sometimes, masajid, are not welcoming. Sometimes you're not finding yourself in a masjid. But you know what? The Prophet ﷺ said the masjid is the home of every believer. Al-Masjid al to kulli Muslim. Every Muslim, their home is the masjid. Their spiritual home is the masjid. You gotta have a place of institution in your life as well. And institutionalizing your good efforts, right? So how do I fill these categories so that I don't meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with a great deficiency in any one of them? What do I need to hear? What do I need to start practicing while I build each one of these? Now, every one of us is going to be imbalanced, but we don't want to be imbalanced in a way that we have fundamental flaws that go unaddressed in our personalities. And the worst type of situation that you can be in, or of the worst situations, is when you're actually being betrayed by a good quality that you possess. Meaning what? Every time you think about improvement, you merely think about a good quality that you already have and simply embellishing that good quality further. I'll give you an example. And to Allah belongs the greatest example. So this is different, but just maybe a human one that you can relate to. All right? Parent tells a child, um, I need you to do this chore by 8 o'clock. Child comes back, doesn't do the chore, says, Mom, I bought you flowers. All right, great. Can you go do the dishes now? I cut the grass. You know, okay, but can you go do the dishes? I vacuumed the living room. What's happening here? There's a disconnect between what you're supposed to be doing and something that you might be doing that might be good. It is good. It's nice that you vacuumed. It's nice that you cleaned up. It's nice that you cut the grass. It's nice that you did all these things. But... You are told to do something very specific and you're not doing it. Now that can become a fundamental and fatal flaw, right? Now with our relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, this is a form of ghurur, deception, delusion. And Imam al-Ghazali rahimahullah ta'ala talks about a very specific type of ghurur here, right? And that is the ghurur of the righteous. So he says, the righteous in quotation marks, so he says for example, the people that can really get caught up into this, he says, scholars, worshipers, people of tasawwuf, so spirituality, and wealthy people. Now, what is he talking about here? He says the scholar might feel a sense of immunity because they teach the religion to the people. And so religion becomes relegated to theory, preaching, telling other people what to do. And the person has no time to practice anything that they are doing. Even worse, intentionally doing other than what they say. Or just not practicing it, letting the hearts rust, not doing anything while telling people how they should be better. And they justify that to themselves by saying, I'm busy. I got to teach the people. And so they live in books and they teach in books and they sleep in books and they never experience Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They might know about Allah, but they don't know Allah. So they're teaching people about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but they're not getting into it. And that's a form of delusion, right? And even worse than that, 
I can tell you this, that in the, in the culture, and, and let's not just take scholars and pick on scholars, people of da'wah, people who are of the quote-unquote religious class, in those circles, some of the worst spiritual diseases go completely unchecked. Because when you see a bunch of religious people backbiting, well, they're religious. And so if this person is doing it, then it must not really qualify as riba then. And if this person is doing it, this person is doing it, can't really be that corrupt. It's so much more blatant and obvious when it's a bunch of people that are clearly far away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talking about something that distances them from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So even the culture that gets created around scholarship and da'wah and things of that sort can be a poisonous one. So ghurur, deception, a fundamental flaw goes unaddressed. A person might worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala a lot. So you could be practicing a major sin, insisting on a sin and having no intention to address it at any point in your life, but you pray extra. You fast extra. Alhamdulillah, you pray Qiyam al -Layl. That's amazing if you're praying sunnahs as well. That's amazing if you're fasting more than Ramadan. But Allah is not going to ask you on the Day of Judgment, why didn't you fast Mondays and Thursdays? Or why didn't you pray at night? And you might be developing an arrogance in the process of that. Self-righteousness, looking down upon the quote-unquote sinners. And so delusion, even though what you're doing is good, you need to address the fatal flaw. People of spirituality, and, and he's, spe he's speaking about a very particular class of people that think that they have access some uh, secret relationship with the divine to where they no longer need to do the actions that are required of the ordinary. So they've reached an extraordinary status where they no longer even need to do the ordinary practices. And people of wealth, and this is by the way very much so, not to pick on rich people, I'm sorry, you know. We, we love you when you give to the massage and then you give to the institutions and you're, but ser on a serious note, if you think about um, where Christianity is going, capitalistic American Christianity is going, right? Write your check to God and you're good. As long as you're putting that check in the bucket on Sunday, you're good. Write your check, right? And we can have a manifestation of that as Muslims. Imam Ghazai, rahimullah, is talking about it centuries ago, where a person feels like, I give charity, and what happens when you give charity? MashaAllah, takbir, Allahu Akbar. Everyone says, MashaAllah, that brother is so generous, that sister is so generous. And they praise and praise and praise and praise. And that person goes home and commits the same sins every day and night, lives in haram because no one even tells them that what they're doing is haram anymore because they want them to keep writing those checks. It's not Islam. You don't get to write a check to God and just turn away. You've got, you've got the same haram and halal as everybody else. But it can feel that way. And society will even prompt you in that way. And the delusion, hence, will grow. So... How do we draw the line? How do we start to come out of this? Well, for one, Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah says something very powerful. He says, as for hasanat, good deeds, he said, both a righteous person and a sinner is capable of doing good deeds, but no one is able to abandon sin unless they're truthful with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Not doing something that Allah tells you not to do is harder than doing something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells you to do or tells you is good for you to do. Think about this for a moment. It's powerful. Why? Because good deeds resonate with your fitrah, the inherent goodness inside of you. So you feel good when you do good deeds. And so you could sit in that place and you could get very comfortable in that and keep on embellishing your good deeds. Giving charity feels great. Volunteering feels great. Praying feels great. And in the 21st century, there are books being written about this. Religion is being relegated to your latest method of self-care. It's your yoga practice on the side. It's how you feel better about yourself when you go to sleep at night. I said I'm going to make you guys a little uncomfortable. I don't want to be rude here, right? But think about it for a moment, right? So you give enough charity, not to the extent that someone needs it, but to the extent that you need to feel good. So that's the amount that I'm going to allot from my life. I'm going to volunteer, and especially in these disaster zones, look, and my heart is not immune. SubhanAllah, like we go to relief camps, distribution sites, and if someone's carrying around the camera the whole time, there's something that can happen there. So you got your great selfie with the dying refugee and then you just walked away. Something's wrong here. 
It's the 21st century though. It is a culture that we have. By the way, that doesn't mean that it's not good for people to be filmed in charity, to invite other people to do good. This is just like other, every other form of charity. But I'm saying if you only do it to the point that it makes you feel good, not to the point that the other person needs, this is what religion is becoming in the 21st century. So you sit in a good place, a place where good deeds make you happy, but you're not abandoning what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells you to abandon. And that's where true sacrifice comes. And Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah says, even atheists are willing to do many good things because those good things make them feel good. So you'll find atheists that will do good deeds and good actions that give them that sense of joy. But when it comes to sacrifice, no, I'm good. I'm good. So what ends up happening is an imbalance with a fatal flaw in your life where you're able to come to peace with the existence of disobedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and you justify it by saying to yourself, but I do all these other good things. I think I'm okay on the day of judgment. And I heard the khutbah and the khutbah said that a person who does this good deed and this good deed is great and is going to come on the day of judgment with this way and this way and this way. Yeah, but if you don't address that other stuff, you've got a hole in your bucket and the water is coming through. So you can keep on pouring water in the bucket or you plug that hole so that the water stops falling through. And there's also a sense of Abu Ayyub al-Ansari radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he says, and I'm paraphrasing because of time here. He said, a person might do a good deed and they rely on that good deed and they forget their sins until they meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala depending upon that good deed and then they find instead that their sins surround them from every direction. Whereas another person might commit a sin and never stop fearing the consequences of that sin until they repent so sincerely that they come on the day of judgment and they find that that sin is not only, not only not a source of distress and consequence for them, but is actually a good deed that's been written down for them. Because istighfar, sincere repentance, turns even sins into good deeds. So they, they didn't depend upon a good deed that they were doing and then say, I'm okay. And it's okay. I'm, I'm going to live with these sins that I know are present in my life with no intention to ever relinquish them. And then they met the consequences on the Day of Judgment. And of course, the worst manifestation of that is when the Prophet ﷺ said, Atadruna man al Do you know who the bankrupt person is? The bankrupt person is the person who comes with all of their prayer, all of their sadaqah, all of their fasting, but at the same time, Sabba hadha wa shatama hadha wa akhtaba hadha wa daraba hadha cursed this person out, foul mouthed with this person, backbited this person, abused this person. And all they find on the Day of Judgment is they basically have their salah, their siyam, their sadaqah taken away from them and given them, given to someone else. Now that's living a life of hypocrisy where you think you can be good with Allah and bad with the people. And that's not possible. 